Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we come this morning together to worship you, we ask that the word that you speak to us this day may be a word of hope, may be a word of courage, a word of strength, and most of all, a word of love. And so grant us that we might hear you, that what I say and what we all hear may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Our Old Testament scripture this morning is from the prophet Nehemiah. We don't read much from him, but he has some words of wisdom for us this morning. So listen, if you will, for the word of the Lord. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together in the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and the, those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So the Israelites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. And from our New Testament, from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is beginning his ministry Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And this is the word of the Lord. Space, the final frontier. 
These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, its five-year mission to explore new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations. And if you know the last, you may say it with me. <laughs> to boldly go where no one has gone before, not men, one. <laughs> That's the next generation. Yes, I know that, but I'm not going with men. We're going with one, where no one has gone before. Now, it's my opinion that this is one of the best mission statements that has ever been written. I mean, it answers all the questions starting with who or what or where or why. Who is it? It's the Enterprise and the crew on the Enterprise. And where? Well, it's in space. And what are they going to do? They're going to seek out and explore. And how are they going to go? Boldly. They will go boldly. And it even answers why. Back in the very beginning, because it's the final frontier. Now, just as an aside, you may not know this, but every Star Trek show, at least in the first series, the true series, <laughs> had this mission statement at the very heart of it as the perspective from which you were to watch the show. Well, Let's try another one. Let's try. We are a community of center, sinners saved by the grace of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We seek to glorify God, to nurture one another, and express the love of God in word and deed. Sound familiar? Read the front of your bulletin. It's on there every <laughs> single Sunday. Well, you know what? That is a clear and well-written mission statement as well. Who are we? Y'all can answer this. Who are we? Yes, that's right. And what are we going to do? Read it. <laughs> <laughs> Glorify nurture, and love. And how are we going to do it? The last phrase. <coughs> In word and deed. And why are we going to do it? Because we are saved and inspired. Every action of ours as the church is to be understood from this perspective. You know, whether we realize it or not, each of us has a central defining force that shapes our life. Now, it might be something like <clears throat> the need to be loved, or it might be wealth. It might be security. You know, it can even be anger or revenge. It's this shaping force it grows in and develops from our struggles as we ask ourselves, who am I? What am I to do? What is my purpose? Why am I here? Good or bad, we find a purpose and we flounder if we don't find some reason for our living. You know, if you peruse the e-books or if you're old-fashioned and go to the bookstore, then what you will see is a massive amount of books that have been written about finding purpose and meaning for your life. I heard about one the other day that is on the bestseller list, and I can't remember the title, and I can't pronounce the name of the person who wrote it, but here's what it's about. If you 
give yourself to tidying up and organizing, you will have your life's purpose. I reject that completely. <laughs> From that all the way over to Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. Look at them. Clearly, we are searching. Clearly, we want to know the purpose. This morning, it is the Sabbath, and Jesus is back in his hometown of Nazareth. He walks into the synagogue as he always did, and he takes the scroll of Isaiah, and standing, he begins to read. Now, friends, every faithful Jew would have recognized this passage because it, was, it had come to be understood as the description of the Messiah who would come to restore Israel. And so it's the Sabbath morning, and Jesus' voice, strong and sure, fills the, sp the synagogue. God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is the year that God is to act. Today, he says, history has come true in your presence. Now, that's the message translation of what we read earlier this morning. And Jesus chose these words to read. He chose them, telling anyone who was willing to listen, this is who I am, this is what I have come to do. Therefore, for us, this is the defining perspective of Jesus' ministry. It is, in effect, Jesus' mission statement. It's a statement of good news that is central to the truth of the gospel. As people of faith, what we believe to be the heart of the gospel is what becomes for each of us that central defining force in our lives. In Jesus, Isaiah's words are the good news. They are the heart of the gospel. This is his mission. This is his map. This is his way. And as his people, we place the map of Jesus' mission over the map of our own purpose. We place his path over our path. The more the paths align, the more we are in keeping with Jesus' call, the truer our course is as his people. But of course, we are only human beings, fallible. And it is easy, it is so easy to get sidetracked from this heart of the gospel, from this central message. I mean, look at Israel in the Old Testament. They certainly got sidetracked over and over and over again, and God sent prophets to call them back to understand God's purpose instead of the people's purpose. As Isaiah did in the Old Testament, so Christ is for us in the New Testament. Christ has given us our mission, our defining force, our reason 
to be, to seek out those who need attention and compassion, to offer the hope of new life in Christ, to boldly go where others choose to pass by. It's not an easy course to follow. But we are not alone as we follow it. I mean, even Christ was not alone in his mission. Because within these verses, there's another key dynamic at work here. Jesus has not come to this point unprepared. I mean, Luke has carefully mapped out for us this journey that Jesus um, traveled in order to get to this Sabbath morning with this scroll in his hand. Um, He's already gone to the River Jordan where he has been baptized by John, rising from the water as the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And that same spirit then leads him into the wilderness of the temptations of power and spectacle. And Jesus is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then and only then does he return to Galilee and to Nazareth to walk into the synagogue of his hometown and claim the words that are written on Isaiah's, on the scroll of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus does not stand and take his mission, read those words without first having been claimed, tested, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so it is with us. It's right there in our mission statement. Take your bulletin and look at it. I'm serious. Take your bulletin and look at it. It is right there in front of us. Saved by the grace of God and what? Inspired by the Holy Spirit. We are prepared and always preparing. You know, that's what we say in the Reformed tradition, right? We're Reformed, and we're always being Reformed or always reforming. We are prepared, and we are, all, we are being prepared. We are preparing. At Spring Valley Church today, we are celebrating the end of a good year the end of 2018, and some of you may have been in the congregational meeting that occurred during the Sunday school hour, and you would have heard the session report on what we've done in the name of Christ over this past year. And you've been given a copy of the annual report, which you should read because it's full of pictures. You have the annual report, and it details our work together, even in the pictures it shows, our work together. And if you ask, how is the church doing? Well, the answer is pretty well. Pretty well. 2018 was a good year. And now... It's time to look forward as we come to the end of this very first month of 2019. It's time to look forward to turn from this day of congratulations to anticipation. And I am right there with you. I think that we can and will and should anticipate what this coming year will bring for us for us to do and to be. But this morning, I'd like to suggest a little different perspective, a perspective that is neither the past nor the future. 
The perspective I suggest to you is the one, the one that I suggest we use is the present, right here, right this moment. Because in truth, it is the present that animates us, enlivens us, lifts us up and energizes us. It isn't the past or the present. It is right now, today, the scripture is fulfilled. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are anointed in Christ's name to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed. To boldly go where life is messy and rough around the edges. To seek out those that we might prefer to ignore. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, Right now, we are prepared. Let us go out boldly. Amen.